Listeners of Shop Talk Live, welcome to a bonus episode. Uh, as promised, my interview with Scott Landis of Greenwood Global. He's got a lot of fantastic information that every woodworker needs to know and accept into their beings. And a lot of great stories about the work that he's been doing with Greenwood Global. If you haven't bought your mallet from Lee Valley yet, please head on over to find where... <laughs> it just flows out. Please head on over to Lee Valley and uh, pick up your Greenwood mallet. It's going to do a lot of good for a lot of people. And also, as you'll hear in this episode, Greenwood has a GoFundMe page set up to uh, fill the gap in some funding that has recently opened up, unfortunately. There will be a link below. If you think that Greenwood is doing good work, uh, you can head on over and, you know, five, ten bucks. Every little bit helps. Uh, also, I want to let everyone know that we are looking for you to post pictures of your tool storage that you're proud of on Instagram. And if you do, tag it with Hey FWW, H E Y F W W. And that will get you in the running to be included in our upcoming tools and shops issue. We're going to be doing a gallery of readers tool storage. So if you've got a cool tool cabinet or tool chest, tool box, whatever, post a picture, hashtag Hey FWW. If you do that, you'll also be entered to win a unlimited subscription. So if you want to be in, in the annals of, of fine woodworking history forever, this is your chance. Good luck. All right. Here's Scott. Scott Landis. Uh, first and foremost, I just found out that you wrote the legendary Taunton book. Work benches. <laughs> it's, it, that was that was the simple name, right? It was the, just workbenches. The workbench book. The workbench book is the official title. <laughs> 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 and if, if anyone out there has not seen this book, you need to check it out. It's a beautiful book, wonderfully shot, and it's a great overview of workbench. What, what was when? When did you do that? I wrote that in, um, I would say 88, 80, 87, 88, mm -hmm. 89. It was published. Um, I'm not even sure what the, what the year was. <laughs> yeah. It was published around 1990. Um, it's, it's amazing because when you look at it, it could have been published yesterday. Because workbenches, <laughs> I mean, there, there's not a whole lot of movement in technology in workbenches. So it's, it's, well, it applies the, today. Well, there was the, the one new workbench that was featured in the book was the workmate. The, uh, the oh, black, yeah, the black yeah, and Decker yeah. workmate mm -hmm. was the last chapter in the book. And, uh, but, Basically, it was looking back at the history of workbenches and the way they evolved to suit uh, the, the various woodworking traditions, mm -hmm. from you know the simple Japanese bench to uh, Swedish and um, uh, European benches. Um, so it was my it was my personal exploration, really, the, uh, with the help of dozens <laughs> of, of woodworkers who had actually been building them and using them yeah. to, to suit their tools and the work they did. But you're not doing anything with workbenches anymore, except leaning on, on them. <laughs> uh, no, I uh, these days not. Um, I have for the last thirty years basically been focused on uh, uh, tropical rainforests, um, working with communities to help them uh, manage those forests, uh, develop products, wood, high quality wood products that could be made from those forests, the, the basic idea being to provide incentives for people to manage forests. Um, where, where are you working? Uh, is there one region in particular or? We started working in Honduras 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and we continue to work there. Um, about uh, eight years ago, I also founded a, uh, another nonprofit, um, uh, called Fundacion Madera Verde, which is our counterpart partner organization in Honduras. And oh, so they're based in Honduras. They are based and, in Honduras, okay. and they are now uh, entirely owned and operated by local Hondurans. Mm -hmm. It's by and for Hondurans. Mm -hmm. um, but we partner, Greenwood uh, partners with uh, Madera Verde whenever we're working in Honduras. Um, so we've been 25 years on the ground working in Honduras. We worked for five years in the Peruvian Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, and we are just now actually starting to uh, 
uh, starting to work in Puerto Rico. Um, oh, really? Yeah. So that's a what? What brought that on? Uh, Hurricane Maria and yeah. Irma okay. <laughs> br- brought it on. Um, this is kind of the tail end of the story, but the um, uh, we had actually been. Um, let me start some. <laughs> um, we had been working in Honduras in um, around 1999, 2000, um, with a, a group of communities in a very remote uh, Mosquito Coast area um, uh, next to the, uh, uh, the 1.2 million acre Rio Plátano Biosphere Reserve. Um, the... Uh, I had been approached by folks at Mystic Seaport in Connecticut who were at the time uh, building the schooner Amistad, um, the one that was used in the, in the movie. Mm-hmm. And they were looking for uh, what are called ship's knees, curved timbers, natural curves that are taken either from the root section or the branch section uh, of a tree. And we produced a container load of knees for the Amistad from a, one of these remote communities um, in the buffer zone of the biosphere. Um, so, so, and let's be clear, when you're talking remote community, what, what, are, the, what are the accommodations like? In well, <laughs> in those days, to get there, it, it's changed a bit over the last, as you might imagine, over the last 25 years. Um, but uh, in those days, we had to, we flew to the coast and then took a dugout canoe upriver uh, about a, almost a full day mm-hmm. and, uh, and then hiked in um, about uh, four hours to get to the community uh, on uh, dirt roads and trails. These days, it's, um, the, the roads have, have improved somewhat. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's about a, uh, it's about a, a 10 hour drive, um, uh, about half of that on um, off road uh, or on uh, dirt roads. Uh, we have to cross two rivers um, where they, uh, you drive the truck on a raft that's constructed on top of two dugout canoes that are planked over okay. um, with an outboard motor that pushes it. So you've got one or two trucks on the, on the raft. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's remote. Yes. Um, and yeah, you're a half a day uh, drive from Blacktop um, and there's no, uh, you know, no, you're off, well off the grid. There is no, uh, no elect, electric power. So, um, so back in '99, you're, you're, you've been tasked to get ship's knees. This curve, what, where do you get them? Well, we, it was kind of, it was a combined project because we, we were introduced to these, uh, a, a cluster of communities in this area. Um, by actually an Italian NGO that was doing forest management with these groups. And one particular group, a community called Copen, was the first FSC certified forest, uh, community forest in the world, I believe. So what what does that mean? It means that they had been, um, they had met the standards of what was then a very young forest certification movement um, that... uh, uh, those are standards of quality of forest management, um, uh, uh, fair treatment of employees, um, uh, healthy practices. Um, uh, the the way uh, there were no roads or heavy equipment. This was all very artisanal in uh, mm-hmm. in in the harvest process. Um, uh, people would go into the forest and cut with chainsaws, and then. Um, move the wood out on mules. Um, okay. So uh, no trucking and uh, until it got out to a road. Um, so it, it met all of these, you know, the uh, social standards, the environmental standards, uh, the, uh, the employment criteria uh, to become certified. When we were approached by this Italian NGO that had helped these communities get this certification, he said, well, we've, we've achieved this great standard but they have no market and are not making anything for sale. They have no way, once we leave the, this NGO that supported their forest management practices, once we're done, uh, they have no way to, to sustain this forest management uh, program that we put in place. So they've, they've done the work to do everything by the book, 
But if they right. can't sell the product. And that, unfortunately, that uh, is the reality for an awful lot of um, communities that have become particularly small community uh, forest enterprises. I'm not talking about industry here, but, um, and um, so that, that's exactly right. So uh, it happened that these communities had uh, a considerable inventory of old growth mahogany in uh, about, um, each community had about uh, 4,000 hectares of, uh, of rainforest that they managed. Hectares, about two and a half acres. Okay. So, you know, we're talking almost 10,000 acres, um, uh, of which their, uh, their typical uh, management plan, an annual harvest, might involve cutting six or eight trees out of oh. almost 10,000 acres. So we're, so being we're talking selective. very selective, very, very small volume. Um, so we went in, we, at that point, and it's, it's a, all, there are many interconnected pieces here that, to tell this story. Um, but um, we went in with the idea of trying to find the highest value product that these folks could, uh, could produce from the smallest number of uh, trees harvested. Um, the, over time, we came to, be, to, to call it down to the squeal. We want to use as much of these trees as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, what we decided to do was to focus on the musical instrument uh, market. And we approached uh, several guitar companies about uh, their possible interest in, in this mahogany. Mm -hmm. And the one that stepped forward, stepped up to the plate, was Bob Taylor from Taylor Guitars. And he said, send us some samples. Mm -hmm. And so we began by sending uh, 50 guitar sets. And a set is uh, neck, back, and sides of a single guitar, for a single guitar. And the, the people in the community are are milling the lumber to, to the backs and, and the necks? What or? they were basically milling blanks okay. that Taylor would then turn into those parts. Okay. Would, um, so we're talking, at that point, it was uh, a four-by-four four stock mm -hmm. for, uh, for the neck stock, mm -hmm. and then there were other dimensions for the backs and sides. And these were all cut with chainsaws. That's all, all they had. Okay. Um, and uh, so we produced 50 sets, back, um, back sides and neck, um, for 50 guitars, mm -hmm. um, sent them to Taylor, and he said, the wood looks great. Um, let me know when you can send a container. Well, that started a process. We said, okay, um, uh, cutting a container of uh, this incredibly beautiful high-value mahogany with chainsaws doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. You waste a lot of wood with a chainsaw. That is the typical, at the time, that was where how basically all wood was being cut in these rural parts of Honduras. Um, so enormous amount of waste. Um, and uh, we developed a process where um, we introduced the use of Alaska chainsaw mills, so a guided mill, okay. um, which uh, we use at the stump uh, because, um, well, we, we would... Uh, after the tree is cut, we would, um, we would, um, the primary processing would be done with the Alaska mill and chainsaw mm -hmm. into cants, which would be roughly five inches thick by 10 inches wide by mule length. Uh, because these forest locations were about between two and six hours from the community by foot or mule. That was, that was yeah. the main mode of transportation. Um, no trucks again, no roads. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, couple of instances, we also floated some of these cans down, down river. Mm -hmm. um, then we arranged for um, low interest loans for um, the communities to purchase Woodmiser bandsaw mill. Mm -hmm. um, we eventually did this with three different communities. Um, one of Greenwood's principles has always been that we don't give stuff away. Um, we're not a... Um, we're, the, it's not a charity approach. We yeah. give away information, training. Um, We're um, teaching them to fish. Yeah, yeah. basically that's it. Um, and that people need to have a stake and, and they need to have skin in the game. Yeah. Um, and so that's been the approach from day one. 
Um, and that's, uh, that was definitely part of the whole um, milling, the approach to getting the, the loans so the communities could, um, could purchase and own the mills themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so we brought Woodmiser Bandsaw Mill uh, into the community. Um, and we decided as a prelude or a first step to making guitar parts, which are a really high value product, um, we would uh, uh, construct some plank built boats first. Uh, boat building being a little more flexible, forgiving than a guitar, okay. than a guitar and a guitar part. And it would give the communities a chance to you know, get up to speed with wood processing mm -hmm. and dimensions and um, just the operation of the mill. Um, at around the same time that, um, so we contacted Mystic Seaport where uh, I knew the, the, uh, uh, the fellow who was in charge of the, of the lumberyard, Quentin, uh, Quentin Snedeker and his brother David. Um, they, um, they brought in, uh, other uh, mystic boat builders. We designed, um, some, um, plank built river boats, uh, similar to the, to the dimensions, um, and, uh, uh, the proportions of the, the, um, the dugout canoes in the area. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also recognize that those dugout canoes that I mentioned would require a single, large mahogany tree, an ancient tree, to build one boat yeah. because it is excavated and you, wa waste. you waste the entire <laughs> center yeah. of the lock. Um, and the reality was that folks in these local communities were going farther and farther into the forest to find these enormous trees for their, for their boats. And many of these are harvested illegally in the mm -hmm. area. And uh, so we were looking for an alternative. Um, it's, it's almost like you're, <laughs> you're identifying fires cropping up all over the place through, throughout this entire process and putting them out bit by bit. Well, we, we are, <laughs> and, yeah. and it's, you know, I'd sometimes call it following my nose, you know, that's one thing would lead to another yeah. and it all kind of intersects, uh, in every way, the positive and the negatives, uh, as I, and I'll get into some of the negatives later, but the, um, but yeah, so in, the, in contacting Mystic Seaport uh, and starting to design these, uh, these flat bottom river boats, which were kind of based on old New England traditions of the, the, um, uh, the French Canadian bateau, which was used for logging in northern Maine and, okay. um, and in the Maritimes. Um, we also discovered that Mystic was building uh, the, uh, the, Mystic was building the Amistad uh, that was going to be used in the, in the movie. So they asked us if at the same time that we were harvesting these mahogany trees for, uh, for Taylor guitars, um, might we be able to find uh, these curved timbers that come out of the branch sections or the roots of, uh, of these large mahogany trees that they could use in the Amistad because they need, needed them for um, the structural members uh, inside the boat. Mm -hmm. So, we, <laughs> now you have we, task. we we had another task, <laughs> and it was another opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so uh, that's what we did. And we filled a container with uh, with ship's knees that were used in the construction of the Amistad. Um, and um, <laughs> I'm just I, you've got so much going on. <laughs> Let's see. I just, yeah, I just <laughs> so 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 you're you're selling you're you're selling wood to Taylor. You're selling wood to um, oh to Mystic. Mm -hmm. and then yeah. So we sold the container to Mystic. We then did uh, two workshops in boat building, working with Wade Smith, was the uh, working at Mystic as an instructor at the time, mm -hmm. and Wade taught two uh, uh, two boat building workshops um, in the same community of Copen. Uh, we built about a 30-foot, um, what's called a pipante, a, um, uh, a large flat-bottom uh, riverboat. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we built several smaller, um, about 12 or 14-foot uh, cayucos, which is more like a canoe, mm -hmm. kind of a double-ended pointed boat. Um, and um, 
again, in that area, the river traffic at that point was the main mode of transportation, the way to get to these uh, remote communities most efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, some of that changed and has changed over the last 20 years or so uh, as roads have been built in the area and uh, and so folks are using the rivers less and are using, mm -hmm. using the roads more now. Um, but uh, once those workshops got done, we had this request from, from Taylor Guitar saying, send us a container when you're ready. It took us two years then to uh, get the, the sawmills in place, do the boat, uh, the boat building. Uh, we did the knees at the same time, and then uh, it took us two years to get that first container to mm -hmm. Taylor, which was about 2004. So how many, um, how many guitar sets are in a container? Well, the container then was not uh, guitar sets. Okay. Um, the container will run from, uh, you know, depending on the size of the container, if it's 20 or 40 foot, it, it'll range from about 8,000 feet to uh, about uh, 12 to uh, 12 to 15,000 board feet. Um, and is this from the six trees? That that, that's filled? right. That would be from about eight, wow. six or eight trees to fill a container. Wow. Um, and, uh, and in, you know, over, we started with that one first container um, around 2004. And we're now over 30, 30, 35 containers over the last uh, 15, 15 years. So it probably averages about two containers a year. Wow. Some years we don't get any out uh, mm -hmm. for a whole variety of circumstances. It can be weather, it can be the timing of the permits, um, because every community has to get go through uh, what is an incredibly onerous and lengthy bureaucratic mm -hmm. uh, permitting process. Um, uh, and I've got a good recent example of how that has really um, thrown some curveballs at, at us now. But um, um, roughly two containers a year. Okay. Um, and we started uh, with Taylor. Um, the pieces were four by four, uh, uh, one dimension, one grade. Uh, over time, we increased and the, um, the variety of dimensions and grades. So now uh, I think we probably have about five different uh, dimensions of, uh, of mahogany that we've been uh, selling to Taylor and to other clients, so also to Collings Guitars in Texas mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, uh, some smaller outfits in, uh, in the U.S., uh, in uh, Montana and, and uh, Allied Lutheran in California. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and about four or five different grades. And so the, uh, um, the, the whole idea, again, is that whole down to the squeal approach. Mm -hmm. Try to use as much of that tree as possible, get the highest possible value out of every tree, um, and the highest possible return for the groups on the ground. So, so how, many, how many people does this employ in Honduras? In the, each community would kind of divide it, its, uh, its um, their local members. They're, they're typically, um, these are uh, called agroforestry cooperatives that we're working with in okay. each community. Um, and typically each cooperative is comprised of between 25 and 30 something members. Wow. Um, and then within those groups, um, they will divide up uh, teams. So there'll be a harvest team that might involve um, five or six men. Um, there'll be a, uh, a team of mule drivers. Mm -hmm. And that can vary, all of these can vary enormously depending on the, um, the group and the, just the local conditions at the time. But the, you know, there might be, uh, four or six mule, uh, mule drivers. Um, when, uh, when the, the mules have hauled these cans to, um, that have been chainsawed, uh, to the community, they arrive at the sawmill, and there'll be another team at the mm -hmm. sawmill. There'll be uh, typically a couple of sawyers, a couple of graders, um, and uh, and and then uh, maybe a larger number of uh, people around to stack wood and sticker it mm -hmm. and paint the ends and you know all the steps of preparing the wood. So. Altogether, you know, there might be maybe half of those groups would be actively involved. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then other community members who are not uh, members of the cooperative will get involved to perform other functions for, uh, and that can be everything from preparing food for the teams, mm-hmm. um, maybe some of the mule drivers who are not technically members. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there might be a, a folks who own the truck to, uh, uh, who can haul from the community then out to town. Um, so there are kind of ancillary um, local, um, local benefits that, uh, uh, that people receive. Yeah. It, it seems like a lot of what you do is find the problem and then find someone to educate other people in the communities. And so you're, you're, you're finding people from around here, well-known people. So, <clears throat> so where does Curtis Buchanan and Brian Boggs figure into this equation? Well, that, that's a really good point because I, I often consider my, my job, my function really as a connector, as mm-hmm. a, um, a convener of, uh, of people, skilled people who can bring uh, the, the, um, the expertise that we need to solve a particular problem. So Curtis, um, uh, to, to bring Curtis and Brian mm-hmm. in, into this, because they were there at the beginning of, uh, of Greenwood, really. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I have to back up one, okay. one step. Yeah. Um, I made a trip to, um, to the, um, the Peruvian Amazon in, in the late 80s. It was 88 or 89 um, to do a story, actually, for Fine Woodworking. Mm-hmm about a, an experimental um, indigenous cooperative in the Amazon that was harvesting, uh, harvesting wood. Uh, in a, the experiment was um, they were using a method called the strip shelter belt harvesting, which was clear cutting narrow strips of rainforest. And they were experimenting with um, the, what was the optimal width, to find the optimal width of these clear, clear cuts for natural regeneration to occur huh. without having to replant. Okay. Um, and uh, so this it was a pretty, um, it, this took place, this experimental process took place in the 80s and it was uh, funded in part by USAID uh, support and it was pretty well known in, in uh, tropical forestry circles. Um, the um, we were invited. I, I was invited to um, by folks at um, uh, Luthiers Mercantile in mm-hmm. then in, in um, Healdsburg, California, um, to go down to uh, to this project because they were they were working with the Sonoma County Woodworkers Association to import the first container of woods from this uh, this indigenous cooperative. The point being that when you clear cut um, uh, a narrow strip in tropical rainforest, unlike a, uh, a, um, a northern Appalachian forest uh, here in North America, there are hundreds of tree species in that forest. Here, there might be a couple dozen. Yeah. Um, there, there are hundreds, as some say, you know, thousands of tree species in, in those tropical forests. Um, you need to find as for for this to be a viable um, uh, productive enterprise, you need to find uses for as many of those woods as possible. Mm-hmm. So uh, the Sonoma County woodworkers have gotten together with um, the Luthiers Mercantile to import this container of uh, uh, of I believe there were about ten different um, what are called lesser known tropical species that mm-hmm. had no markets. Those were not mahogany. Rosewood, um, lignum vitae, none of those species were part of this. Um, and uh, I went down to write about this in an article for, for Fine Woodworking. Uh, came back and researching the article, <clears throat> wound up meeting, <clears throat> in researching the article, I wound up meeting a lot of folks, woodworkers, uh, wood importers, tool people like Lee Valley Tools, mm-hmm. um, who also had an interest in uh, trying to um, trying to approach the use of wood responsibly uh, at a time of diminishing resources. The late 80s, you might recall, was a time when the uh, uh, the rainforest was on fire in Brazil. Um, uh, there were calls to boycott tropical woods entirely, okay. um, and a lot of woodworkers felt 
um, felt whipsawed really between the, uh, the movement to boycott tropical woods on the one hand and their, uh, their wood dealers who were saying, um, if you don't buy these woods, uh, we're the only ones who are getting money into these communities. Um, yeah, and, and, it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, it is complicated. And if you don't buy these woods, if they can't sell these, um, uh, can't get value from these forests, those forests are disappearing, and they're going to disappear faster and faster and be converted to agriculture. Because um, all right, so if if the four if the if the trees aren't bringing revenue in, they're right. just going to cut them down and plant crops. And that's been happening for. Uh, you know, forever, but it's been happening at a really intensive and intensifying rate over the last 30 years okay. um, and continues today. So uh, to, to get back to how we got to Greenwood, uh, in uh, writing this article, met a lot of folks who had a vested interest in this, uh, trying to do the right thing. We, we held a conference at UMass in Amherst, and um, um, Silas Kopf uh, was a... Um, partner of mine in, uh, in that whole process. Mm -hmm. Silas had started an organization called Ward, Woodworkers Against Rainforest Destruction. Um, we held this conference, and um, out of that conference, uh, we created another organization called WARP, the Woodworkers Alliance for Rainforest Protection. We okay. decided to put a positive spin yeah, yeah, yeah. on Silas's um, Against Rainforest Destruction. Mm -hmm. Um, Silas was uh, an original board member, um, and uh, I was publishing, uh, once we established Warp, I published a, um, a newsletter called Understory for, for Warp. And I did an article uh, for Understory by Michael Fortune, um, who had uh, done a project. Uh, he traveled to Mexico, to Quintana Roo, to the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, uh, on um, a development project. And Michael came back, and in this article, he wrote about all the ways in which it didn't work. Um, Michael had landed in uh, what would be a first world woodworking shop. Uh, power tools, uh, jointer planer, uh, and table saw, all the, you know, mm -hmm. the, the equipment you might find in, in a North American shop. What he found in this community was that the electricity was uh, sporadic. Uh, some days there was none. Some days you had it for an hour or two. Um, so that equipment was basically useless when the power was gone. Um, the, this equipment is all designed to be used with uh, kiln-dried wood, mm -hmm. also not available locally. Mm -hmm. Uh, all the wood was green or at varying, li uh, varying uh, moisture contents uh, from air drying. Um, if a machine broke down, where do you get parts? There were none. Um, so it was this whole litany of um, issues related to the, the technology that was uh, just the wrong scale, inappropriate for, um, uh, for the local resources, uh, which, by the way... It, we found all over. Uh, I found it in Peru. I found it in Honduras. Um, uh, the the product of uh, well intentioned but um, poorly conceived development uh, projects. Mm -hmm. um, we published that article. Curtis Buchanan called me up. I'd get to Curtis eventually. Here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, Curtis called me up and he said, "I don't have that problem." He said, "I I make my Windsor chairs. I split it out of the log." He said, yeah, I've got a lathe that plugs into the wall, but it doesn't have to. He said, I could, I could do it with a treadle lathe. He does a lot of, he, he splits the log, okay. um, splits it into smaller pieces, works it down on a shaving horse with a draw knife. Um, and he said, um, why don't we, uh, wouldn't it be interesting to do a, uh, uh, a development project to apply this kind of appropriate technology to um, to development to mm -hmm. the problems that uh, that warp is trying to address. I thought that was a good idea. Yeah, it it made a whole lot of sense. So um, I had been invited by uh, happened just uh, serendipitous uh, invitation from a, a Honduran uh, forester who I met at a conference. Um, we described. Uh, uh, we were talking, and I described this concept, and he said, 
that sounds ideal. The communities we work with are off the grid. They have no electricity. Uh, all the, all the, uh, the issues that you've just described apply to these, mm-hmm. these villages. Um, but we've been doing forest management. And again, they have no local production, uh, no way to make a product that could be sold in their own markets or, or beyond. Um, so he invited us to Honduras. Uh, Curtis and Brian Boggs made the first trip in 1993. Mm-hmm. And it was focused, as it would be from Curtis and Brian, on chair making. Mm-hmm. Um, we started with, uh, with uh, actually this kind of uh, uh, ladder back woven, um, woven bark seating mm-hmm. uh, design that uh, Brian introduced. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, we eventually, over the years, moved. Uh, we also then, Curtis introduced Windsor chairs. Mm-hmm. So that's how Curtis and Brian got mm-hmm. involved. Um, we, as I said, we brought, you know, we've tapped boat builders to come down and, uh, from Mystic Seaport to, to do boat building, uh, and produce the knees. Uh, we brought people in who are, um, sawmill, um, mm-hmm. uh, experts to help set up mills, wood graders. Uh, Taylor Guitars has sent some of their own people down mm-hmm. to help train the local communities to grade wood. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, sometimes the Taylor guys have gone out and slept in the forest and, you know, and, mm-hmm. um, for a week at a time with the guys who are harvesting to help them. You know, when you look at a log, how you break that log down at the, mm-hmm. the initial cuts is crucial. Um, uh, so there have been lots of different skills. Um, a, one really, uh, a, a fun example too is, um, uh, for five years, um, we worked with, uh, a group of, actually, it's ironic. I, I got reconnected, uh, about 15 years after my trip to Peru, got reconnected with a Peruvian, uh, NGO that was working in the very same communities that I had visited in the late 80s. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were making, uh, they were making ads carved bowls mm-hmm. like this. You can see the ad, ads marks here. Um, we connected and, and um, this Peruvian NGO invited us to come in and help them improve the quality of their production, the efficiency, um, the marketing, the mm-hmm. basically bring those skills uh, that Curtis and Brian brought to chair making um, to, to this effort. Um, Curtis and Brian actually made uh, one of the f- first trips um, to Peru for a workshop that we did there. We later followed up with, uh, I think Brian made another trip to, um, to Peru. Um, but we also followed up with, uh, Andy Jack from, um, uh, Western Mass, Tim Manny from up in Portland, mm-hmm. Maine, uh, made a couple of trips, both, uh, Andy and Tim. And on one of the first things, uh, Andy and Tim recognized was that the, um, the importance of tool sharpening. It's something we've recognized on all of our trips, but, and it's something that every woodworker in any North American yeah. shop or any shop around the world eventually, uh, has to come to terms with. But we're coming to terms with it with high grade steel and. Right. <laughs> exactly. Not homemade ads, yeah. adzes. So they started, uh, um, Andy and Tim started, uh, focusing on, uh, tool sharpening. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's become kind of a staple of a lot of the the workshops we do. What they also recognized or, or, or realized uh, pretty quickly was that the ads is that, that were being used to carve these products, this, this big, Mm -hmm. big boat like, uh, bowl is, Mm -hmm. is another, um, ads carved product from Peru. What they realized was that the ads is they were using were poorly shaped, for mm-hmm. for these the curves of, of the products they were making, and they were poorly tempered, um, so they were either they were made by a local blacksmith um, mm-hmm. who didn't really understand how they were going to be applied, and they were either too soft um, to uh, um, to hold an edge, or they were so hard you couldn't touch them with a file, mm-hmm. or you could barely barely touch them, so they were typically dull, mm-hmm. so the wrong shape and dull. We, uh, we brought Don Weber, um, Welsh chair maker, uh-huh. um, who, uh, 
is now living in Kentucky, uh, at least last time I, mm -hmm. I checked with Don. Um, Don um, is a uh, chair maker blacksmith. And uh, Don came in working in a workshop with, with Tim Manny and Andy Jack. Um, we, they um, made charcoal in these uh, remote Yanesha tribe villages. Um, a 55 gallon drum full filled with uh, chunks of uh, local hardwoods mm -hmm. smoldering overnight. Uh, created charcoal, um, built a couple of forges. Uh, we reshaped the adzes to uh, to a, a more appropriate curve. Uh, Don uh, retempered them to a, you know the, mm -hmm. the right uh, the right temper for holding an edge, um, and um, and they had a much more efficient tool. The production improved dramatically. Um, One more example of going. Again, following that line. Yeah, there's that a path. problem. How are we going to solve this yeah. problem? Um, we took it one more step. Um, and um, Curtis actually had introduced me to a, um, uh, a chainsaw sculptor named Brad Sells, mm -hmm. who, uh, who has a shop outside of uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, Brad does very sophisticated art sculpture. Mm -hmm. um, usually when I tell people chainsaw sculpture, it conjures up uh, bears and saxophones. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's not Brad. Yeah, okay. uh, <laughs> um, Brad's work is, uh, many of his bowls are translucent. Um, and he, he, oh, I've he, seen, carves, yes, yes. he carves the shape with a chainsaw or different chainsaws, does a lot of finishing work with air tools. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the work is extraordinary. Yeah. Um, we were not intending to do that that kind of sculpture. What Brad came down to do was to introduce the use of the chainsaw as a tool for excavating mm -hmm. um, most of the wood from um, from these dense tropical hardwoods, which they were all using, mm -hmm. um, and then allowing them to finish uh, the inside with the ads and get the handmade, um, the hand finished, uh, hand tooled um, uh, feel. So to, identifying to the, the tools that they have and making the best use out of them. Exactly. So, so t tell us about your current the, project. The, okay. The mallet. So the I had um, Greenwood and before it Warp actually had um, uh, one of the people who attended our very early. Um, uh, meetings that led to the creation of Warp and eventually Greenwood was Leonard Lee, who was the founder of Lee Valley Tools. Okay. Leonard was a, a board member of our first board of Warp and, and Greenwood. And uh, Leonard uh, sadly passed away uh, about a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I've stayed in touch with uh, his son, Robin Lee, mm -hmm. who now runs Lee Valley Tools. And it was during a, a visit I had with uh, Robin in his office in Ottawa, Ontario, um, that he showed me some uh, prototype ma mallets that um, Lee Valley had had produced, I believe, in uh, Uruguay or Paraguay, South America. Uh, somebody had produced these. Uh, Lee Valley had done the design. They'd had them produced, um, a couple prototypes, um, years ago, and nobody had, um, had followed through. They never got any production. Uh, he showed them to me and he said, is that something that your folks could do? And I said, sure. <laughs> and um, around the same time, this was about now about two and a half years ago, uh, I got introduced to um, a, um, uh, another Canadian, as it happened, um, Scotty Lewis, mm -hmm. a, an Ontario uh, furniture maker who had worked at the time with Michael Fortune. Um, and Scotty had designed a bicycle drive lathe mm -hmm. uh, that had been featured by the AAW, American mm -hmm. Association of Woodturners. Um, he did an article for them, um, the design of this two-man bicycle lathe um, uh, was put in their magazine. And he, he had done a workshop in the Dominican Republic where he installed one of these bicycle lathes. And, um, I looked at that and thought again about the communities we work in mm -hmm. that are off the grid 
And we had been working with, um, with human-powered lathes since um, the 1993 trip that Curtis and Brian took. Those were treadle lathes mm -hmm. uh, that are best suited for turning things like legs and, and rungs of chairs. Not great for turning bowls or heavier heavier yeah, stock. Where you're taking off a lot of material. These you of, can rive them close. Yeah. And yeah. Yep. Um, and uh, so uh, we had actually had had an intermediate lathe where again Don Weber had gone to. Uh, we brought Don into Honduras uh, before we uh, he went to Peru with us, and Don had designed a another foot powered lathe using a bicycle chain mm -hmm. uh, drive and sprocket mm -hmm. with a, a flywheel mm -hmm. to turn bowls, and we did some bowl turning there. Mm -hmm. um, but I looked at this two man uh, bike lathe that Scotty had done and thought, gee, that. You know, some of the places we work with are school situations as well, mm. where it's a great way to engage uh, uh, youngsters yeah. in this process. And uh, and the kid who's pedaling gets to watch almost like the old apprentice and the and you know the big great mm -hmm. wheel lathe. Um, so we um, we uh, brought Scotty in to uh, uh, to install the first um, two man bicycle lathe in Honduras uh, about two years ago um, with some uh, partner support from the AAW in that mm -hmm. effort. Um, we built the, uh, built the lathe, conducted a workshop in one, two, I think two or three different uh, community locations. Again, working with some of these partners or the uh, these community groups that we were also involved with in the guitar part production. Mm -hmm. um, Again, looking for other ways to add more value mm -hmm. to a wider range of tree species. Uh, and um, uh, we thought the mallets could be a, a, a perfect ve vehicle for mm -hmm. that um, because mahogany would not be the wood I would select for a, uh, for a carving mallet. You wanted uh, a denser wood, interlocking grain. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there are a whole bunch of local uh, species that essentially have... Uh, Maybe some of them might have a local market, very, uh, very limited. Mm -hmm. Most of them have no market at all. Um, and, uh, and we selected, uh, five different, um, five different wood species, um, to, uh, to, uh, use for the mallet project. Um, and started, uh, one of the, uh, one of the artisans, who we trained actually in, in that first workshop, expressed the greatest interest and aptitude for, mm -hmm. for turning. Uh, we did the following year, we installed a second lathe uh, in Honduras, brought more people uh, into this. And, um, and Juan Vigil, who was the, the turner who uh, had, had shown that aptitude and, and, uh, and really passion for, for mm -hmm. doing this, um, came to that workshop. He took that one of those lathes back to his shop. We installed it in his shop, which was in the most remote community. <laughs> it was at the far end of the of of the uh, the chain here, mm -hmm. um, in um, outside of one of these communities that we'd been harvesting. Uh, again, the knees, the guitar wood, uh, for fifteen to. Um, 20 years mm -hmm. in and he has he and his uh, his wife and two kids live in this uh, this remote village and um, he set up to uh, to make these mallets mm -hmm. um, we provided the wood for him from uh, other community forests that uh, again it has to be uh, coming from a managed forest that mm -hmm. had a management plan where we we were confident in the quality of the management um, and it had to be legal. Um, it happens in Honduras. You cannot, uh, unlike uh, uh, North America or any place I've ever lived, you, you uh, up here you you can't drive um, down a road in Honduras with a uh, log or a stick of wood in the back of your truck unless it is accompanied by a piece of paper mm, that says okay. that that wood has uh, has a legal source. Huh. Or presumably, unless you've paid the uh, the the cop who stops mm -hmm. you, yeah. Um, and we were not about to do that. We've never done that, and uh, so it's um, we we 
I kind of alluded at the beginning to some of the challenges, and it, you know, it's kind of ironic. All the years I, I, I've worked in Honduras, they they have there are wonderful laws um, throughout much of South America and Central mm -hmm. America, um, but few of them are followed. Okay. Um, and um, uh, so um, we were, we are, have always been committed to following the law. But what you encounter in doing that is a very high level of bureaucracy. Um, I often say that, uh, that in many of these uh, countries, um, they confuse bureaucracy with governance. Okay. Um, and so in the absence of governance, they implement um, excessive level of bureaucracy. A um, good example of that is that by law, it's supposed to take the government three months, I believe, to, um, to approve um, a forest management plan that's submitted by a community to the governing authority, to the mm -hmm. forestry authority in Honduras. Um, community we're working with right now, it took a year mm -hmm. for them to get that permit. When their permit arrived, it arrived in September of last year. The rainy season in uh, Honduras starts in September, typically, and the most intensive rainy hurricane season runs from September through December or January. So they lost two years. Well, they lost. They, they decided they were going to cut anyway. They went into the forest in September, the absolute worst time. It was miserable. They did cut those uh, six or eight trees, mm -hmm. and they milled that wood into into the cans, as mm -hmm. I described before. Um, but that harvest location was six hours by foot. It was the farthest we had ever worked mm -hmm. from the community and the sawmill. Um, there was no way that their mule drivers could take their mules. We would often field a 15 to, to 20 mules for these teams to bring wood out of the forest. Wow. Um, and uh, mules are... Uh, they're a valuable asset in these communities. Mm -hmm. People didn't want to lose their lose their animals. And um, so the wood stayed in the forest uh, from September uh, to about March when we the the uh, the trails dried enough mm -hmm. that they could start to harv to to haul that wood out. And that's what they've been doing now since March. Most of it now in this one community called Miravesa. Most of that wood is now at the sawmill, and they are now processing that and grading it. And it will go. I'm, I'm happy, hugely relieved to say that the quality of the wood turned turned out not to have been um, uh, significantly degraded yeah, by that yeah. time, which was a concern. It was mm -hmm. stacked carefully and um, and uh, and covered. And um, and mahogany is an amazing wood as well. Yeah. So. Uh, it's now being processed, and we're we're hoping that that load will ship uh, in September or October of this year. Um, but uh, those are the kinds of obstacles that you can run in uh, run into along the way. So, what, one last question. So, I'm I like to consider myself socially conscious and environmentally aware, and things like that. And so, besides buying one of these mallets from Lee Valley, which I'm definitely going to do. I want to make sure that there's a market and I ask all of our listeners to do the same um, because if Lee Valley can't sell the mallets, they're not going to buy more. <laughs> um, so everybody go out and buy one of these mallets first and foremost, but what can the individual woodworker do? I, I've been scared off from many of these species that we talk about. And through this conversation, I'm starting to rethink that. Maybe I just need to be more aware of what I'm buying. Is it is it just looking for F F FSC certified certified lumber or? I wish it were that simple. Okay, you know, and I really do. I mean, I was. It was at that founding conference of Warp mm -hmm. that actually the FSC was conceived. Okay, there were groups of people. A few came from the UK who had been doing something similar in, uh, in the islands in the South Pacific and Papua New Guinea and folks got together in the hallways and said, there's got to be a way we can have a, like a, um, like a good housekeeping seal mm -hmm. of approval on the wood industry, which we've never had. That then led to the creation of the FSC. I have to say over these last 20 or 30 years, I think there are some good certified projects, um, but I don't think it's universal. Okay. And, I, 
you know, I wish it were as easy as just going into Home Depot or going into your local wood supplier and just looking for the stamp and buying that wood. I have become, and through my, and through these last 30 years, and it's kind of evidence in the way Greenwood has evolved, it's really through relationships. Mm -hmm. Relationships both with the people on the ground who are harvesting, who I know personally, mm -hmm. these communities, um, you know, where I've slept in their homes and, mm -hmm. and eaten with them, and I know the people I trust, and, the, and I've been to the forest and seen the work they do. And, you know, relationship with the artisans who are making the products or the, the sawyers who are sawing it. Um, um, I prefer, I, I call it a kind of first person, um, uh, uh, first person verification. It's yeah. not the kind of, that's not the, pr uh, I'll the put process. On that no, that's not the process <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's going to get wood to yeah. your supplier or, yeah. or, um, or to, uh, you know, to Home Depot, certainly. I would say, you know, um, I'd have these conversations with your wood supplier if it's, you know, assuming, okay. assuming it's not, we're not talking, you know, the, ma the big box store, but we're talking about a, you know, a, a smaller, uh, smaller supplier and ask them where they get their wood mm -hmm. and, you know, what, uh, <clears throat> what their level of comfort is with, with the source and have they ever been there? Have their folks ever been on the ground and mm -hmm. seen the way it's harvested? Um, and, uh, I think that will tell you, you know, give you a level of comfort or not mm -hmm. about the um, the way they think about it, the the importance that it has uh, for them, mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, of course, the you can also you know, look locally and get wood, you know, the, where you've got a much more uh, direct. Uh, you know, direct line on the people who are harvesting it. Yeah. I mean, the whole idea of certification from the beginning is that if we all live down the road from the guy who harvests our wood, you know, there'd be no need for it. You'd all, you know, you'd know their families and you'd mm -hmm. have a level of comfort or not about the way it was harvested. Um, that was the theory behind certification. Um, so it's so still best to keep it as local as you can. I keep it as local or, or to, um, uh, you know, I, I still I don't believe in boycotting tropical woods just on a blanket boycott by any means. But but I think asking questions and uh, and you know trying to just trying to uh, uh, do your due due diligence about about the source of supply as as best you can. And be be aware and conscious. And, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you know and and you know, part of the mallet approach too again was. We introduced five species uh, for these mallets. Mm -hmm. There may be, you know, another five that we could introduce over time. Um, going back to that that clear cutting project that I described in the Amazon, mm -hmm. the the whole point is to find as much value from as many different trees, add value to as much of that forest as possible, mm -hmm. and and finding. Um, Finding uses for lesser <clears throat> lesser known woods is really considered kind of the holy grail okay. of sustainable forestry. So, if you can identify somebody who's bringing in an, a you know an alternative, a lesser known wood, and you find it and can use it and like it, and you have a you know good vibe about the source of supply, mm -hmm. um, I'd say go for it. You know, and try to use help it. Help create and, a market. Yeah, yeah, help create markets and interest in in these other woods. Uh, where where can we find out more about Greenwood Global? And uh, you the can, work that you're doing. Yeah, well, you can go to our website is uh, greenwoodglobal.org. Mm -hmm. um, Not dot .com. It's a totally different way. I've, I've, right. I found that out last right. night. Yeah. It, it, I don't know where greenwoodglobal.com takes it. It, it, was, <clears throat> it, was a, it wasn't anything bad, but it definitely was not your organization. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, we're also... Um, uh, I have to say, I've I've not personally been the most social media savvy guy in in the uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the game, and uh, um, but we have uh, just begun to really try to activate our Facebook uh, page and our Instagram account, which are now which is fantastic. Uh, I, well, is thanks. It your son, uh, he's had he's had <laughs> some input, but I've okay. uh, I've worked with a, a couple of volunteers who have. Uh, really been helpful in posting stuff okay. and and you'll see on on uh, both of these uh, both Instagram and Facebook you'll see um, now we've <clears throat> we've put a lot of these stories that I've been telling mm -hmm. in photos uh, 
that have uh, you know that cover the last 25, 30 years of this. You actually, see the craftsmen. Yeah. who are responsible for yeah. the beautiful products. Exactly, and we are starting a um, a crowdfunding campaign. Oh, okay. Um, that will be on GoFundMe. I don't, I can't give you the link at the moment, but you will, I and will. I will have it for the listeners. Yeah, yeah. Um, because you know we were talking about the negatives. Uh, at, at, you'd asked about the negative issues at the beginning, and for the last uh, roughly eight years. Uh, we've had a relationship with the U.S. Forest Service, mm -hmm. which has a Department of International Programs that works all over the world, providing forestry advice and consultation and support for work like, you know, the, well, I, there aren't a lot of outfits that do work like Greenwood, mm -hmm. but, but they have, we've had a contract with uh, the Forest Service for the last eight years uh, for our work in Honduras. And a couple months ago, um, Based, uh, following the State Department's um, decision to not aid development projects in Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, the so-called uh, Northern Triangle countries, that uh, our contract, which is still a valid open contract, was um, suspended indefinitely. Okay. So that's frozen funding for all <clears throat> the kind of work I've just been describing. Okay. And that's put us in a uh, put us and our local partners in Honduras, uh, Fundacion Madera Verde, our partner organization, and the local artisans and communities who depend on this work. So um, there's a GoFundMe to help keep it going. Exactly. Okay, so we can yeah. help Greenwood Global directly. Absolutely. And we will absolutely have links to that. And um, I'm sure it's one of those things that any little bit helps, right? Absolutely, yeah. We, we welcome and, and people, you know, we uh, obviously the the financial support is uh, is certainly needed and very you know, welcome and appreciated. But you know, you may come up with other ideas too for products, for markets, for uh, you know something you've been you've been just burning to to make and mm -hmm. and and teach people how to do someplace that would that would fit right into what we do. Okay, uh, and that's how. You know, that's how Curtis came to me. That's, uh, that's how, you know, Scotty Lewis and the bike lays came, uh, the Amistad knees. Mm -hmm. it's, um, There's your call to action, everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. You got it. Well, Scott, thank you so much for telling us more about Greenwood Global. Everybody go buy a mallet. We'll <laughs> post a link to the GoFundMe. And let's all do our part. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Scott. <laughs>